You're listening to the Martial Arts Business Podcast with your host, Small Dojo Big Profits author, Mike Massey. Remember to go to martialartsbusinessdaily.com slash podcasts for show notes, transcripts, links to martial arts business resources, and more. Now here's your host, Mike Massey. Hey everyone, it's Mike Massey and I'm back with another edition of the Martial Arts Business Podcast. This is the first episode for uh, 2024. I want to welcome everyone back. Hope you had a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays and uh, that your New Year started off right. So I'm going to jump right in and talk about um, the last uh, thing I left you guys with, uh, which was in the last podcast episode. Um, I I told you I was going to take a few weeks off and uh, going to do some uh, personal inventory and evaluation and so forth. Um, I felt like I needed it because um, I had just... Just uh, completed when I did that last podcast episode. I just got to MD Anderson and had my six month checkup, um, six months post uh, surgery. Um, and for those of you that don't know, um, I had a uh, just come through a two year battle with uh, lung cancer. I had a lung sarcoma um, back in. Uh, Gosh, 2021. It was early 2021, I think February. I was diagnosed with uh, an epithelioid angiosarcoma of the right upper lobe of my lung, which is pretty much a death sentence. Um, it's it's uh, it's not a highly survivable cancer at all. And it ended up, I did have a lung sarcoma. It ended up after they took it out, um, which happened in May. Um, they took it out. They took out my right upper lobe of my lung. Everything went fine. They, they got clean margins, got everything out. And it turned out they have something called EHE, which is, I believe endothelial hemangio endothelioma and uh, so it's similar to epithelial angiosarcoma except for it's not um, as initially aggressive although it does tend to when people have tumors for a long time they can they can remain dormant and then they just go haywire and and they go uh, really aggressively grow uh, you know metastasize and so forth throughout the body and it's it's pretty hard to combat so not necessarily um, the best um, alternative diagnosis but it's better than the first one I had so so I went through this two-year battle of, uh, you know, um, going through the whole cancer treatment process, which is deserving of a whole other podcast episode, uh, not necessarily the subject of this podcast or topically, um, you know, on point, but, um, yeah, I could spend a whole podcast talking about that cause it's wild, but, um, we eventually ended up finding a surgeon at MD Anderson, Dr. Rice and his team who was able to remove it. And it was kind of dicey because they didn't know if they could remove it because the tumor was so big. And it was kind of on the, the uh, borderline of, of the size, you know, to where tumors get a certain, to a certain point and, and the survivability rates really aren't that high. So they don't really want to operate on them, but they did on me and they did a good job. So here I am six months later, did my checkup at MD Anderson and, and uh, got a clean bill of health, which I was surprised because I think I was having some psychosomatic issues with breathing and so forth, you know, that's one of the big challenges you have um, when you survive cancer apparently is uh, believing that it's gone. And and I was told that by one of my readers once, you know, when this first started, you know, when I first started the cancer journey. So um, I realized, you know, that uh, I needed to do some, uh, as I said, some personal inventory and assessments. So I took several weeks off in December. Um, all I did was upload some old podcast episodes and uh, kind of, you know, coach the people in my private coaching group, you know, scheduled some content and so forth and and uh, posted a couple of lessons in the app. And then that was it. I took time off. And what I came up with during that time was that um, I am going to do several things in my business uh, in order to uh, hopefully increase my personal happiness and uh, my enjoyment of my time, time with family and, and so forth, and also my professional time. So one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to cut back on the frequency of the podcast. I jumped back into doing the podcast because I was excited about releasing my app and you know I wanted to promote that and so forth. Uh, but what I'm finding is is that even though I have better tools now to do podcasting than I had you know six eight years ago ten years ago when I first started the podcast, um, I it's still a, a huge time suck. It takes hours and hours and hours of planning to be able to plan out, write the scripts and so forth, uh, write my show notes, you know, do research. And uh, also then later afterwards, it takes hours to edit, um, you know, to level the podcast, do all the audio editing and, and, you know, trimming clips and so forth. And then posting them online and then getting the show notes transcribed, um, posting to my blog, you know, posting embedding the, you know, the, the code for the particular episode and then, you know, um, editing show notes and doing all those other things. It's just hours of work. It takes about a, a day's worth of work to do one podcast episode. And I could probably hire somebody else to do it, but I've looked into hiring, you know, audio engineers and so forth, people to do this. And it's just incredibly expensive. 
So, you know, I want to streamline that. And one of the ways that uh, I, I figured that I could streamline it best without cutting back on quality is just by cutting back on frequency. So I'm going to do one podcast episode a month, one new podcast episode a month. And throughout the year, I'm going to continue to upload um, old podcast episodes that are no longer available because um, Anchor and, you know, which is now Spotify lost them, unfortunately. But um, I still have them archived, so I'm uploading them. So I'm going to do that. Um, you know, honestly, I've been working way too much for way too long. Um, I have been running three businesses, um, all the way through the pandemic, really, you know, and I've been doing that for years on and off, you know, um, I'm kind of addicted to running martial arts schools. I have been for a long time. I realized that, um, when I was driving back from seeing, uh, my physician and I was driving back from getting some lab work actually after seeing the physician and I'm driving down the highway. And I see the building where I was teaching uh, Krav Maga classes uh, before the pandemic started and then after the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at this building and, and it's become a, a, you know, a ballet studio now. And, and uh, I was actually sub running space, sub lighting space from a local fitness center in that building. But I knew that the building in the back, the room in the back that I had that I was teaching Krav Maga classes in, you know, might be available. And it took every bit of willpower I had not to pull over, pull off the highway, pull in the parking lot and go check out that space <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, it's a habit, excuse me. I get a cough sometimes because of the surgery. It's a habit that I've had for decades, you know, that, uh, you know, I started martial arts school, started up, get it running, you know, run it for, you know, a period of years and, uh, you know, get the itch out of my system and then decide, okay, I, you know, want to do something else. And, you know, uh, then I would sell it and then move on and take a couple of years off and then get the itch again and have to open a martial arts studio again. And, you know, it's just something that's just, I don't know, it's almost pathological in me that uh, I want to be running businesses, starting businesses and so forth. I have one of those types of personalities that loves the startup phase of, of running businesses. I love the growth phase of running businesses. When it comes to the point where it's the, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff, I don't really care for running businesses on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why I like, you know, starting businesses, growing them and then selling them. But, um, you know, anyway, because of that, you know, because of doing consulting work, teaching martial arts, and then also uh, my writing career taking off, you know, which I started writing full-time roughly 10 years ago. Um, you know, I've just been working too hard and I realized it's had an impact on my health and that needs to change. My body's changed dramatically too, since the surgery and since, you know, having cancer for two years and, you know, being on certain medications during that time, you know, and, and other medications that I was taking, it seems to have, have taken a toll on my body. Um, they noticed an upward trend in my uh, blood urea nitrogen, which means that there's some stress on my kidneys. And, you know, we've seen some elevated, uh, you know, liver enzyme levels and so forth. So I need to deal with those aspects of my health too. And I really need to focus on regaining my health for good. And it's hard to do that when you're busy all the time. And, you know, the third thing is I realized um, over the last few weeks that I just haven't been happy. Even though I'm a very goals oriented person, I'm also a very performance oriented person. And I feel as though um, I get guilty when I'm not performing at a very high level. And I think that in some ways that can be healthy when you're working on building a career, building businesses, uh, building a reputation in business, et cetera. But unfortunately, you know, it doesn't work very well for you when you can't balance those, those needs, those desires, those, uh, that drive with your family life and personal life and so forth. And I don't, I don't really think I was, I don't think I was doing a very good job of that. And I just, you know, came to the conclusion over the last few weeks that I have not been happy. Um, cancer really caused me to reassess my values and, uh, my values have really shifted from being performance based and performance focused now to being more focused on my quality of life on a daily basis and having quality experiences. So that's where, you know, that's, that's kind of where my focus is moving toward. And, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of more about, you know, when you, when you spend a couple of years thinking that your life has been shortened substantially, dramatically, you know, I'm in my early fifties, you know, so I have a good, you know, 25, 30 years left, you know, barring any other major health issues or whatnot, or, you know, a sudden myocardial infarction, which can happen. But, um, you know, barring the good Lord taking me home early, you know, I have a few decades left of, uh, of quality time that I can spend with family and friends and so forth. And I want to make sure that it is quality time. And I don't want to spend all that time 
you know, chasing dreams and goals that, you know, I've, I've really already accomplished in my professional life. So, so there's that. So you can expect to see in the next year, over the next year, one new quality podcast episode every month. Um, some of those will be, some of those episodes will be interviews. Some of them will be me um, discussing different issues that I think instructors are facing these days and uh, providing suggestions about how you can deal with those. And and so that's that's what you can expect me in 2024. So if you have any questions or anything, or you want to contact me, you, know, you can always reach out to me over Facebook. And you know, if you just want to contact me and say, hey, I think you're doing a good job on the podcast. Of course, you can always do that by leaving a positive review on on iTunes and so forth, wherever you listen to podcasts, and that's fine. But you can always, always contact me directly. Directly. Just uh, follow the Martial Arts Business Daily group on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash martial arts business daily, I believe, is the is the address. And if you go to that, um, you follow me, um, you can message me through the page. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Okay. So another thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to focus a lot less on providing what is essentially free coaching online. I've been running the Small Digit Big Profits group for several years. Um, I had brought on another instructor who was one of my clients to be a consultant a few years back. And, and uh, that, that, situation didn't work out, but he did suggest, you know, expanding my online presence at the time. And so we started that free small digital big profits group and he ran it at first. And then, you know, after, you know, we split ways, we parted ways. Um, I took the group over and, you know, I've been doing, you know, more or less having a, a weekly presence in that group. And it, it's another time suck. And essentially what happens is, is, you know, you run these free groups, these free discussion groups, people expect to come into those groups and get your time for free. And I've really had to train people to not expect to get my time for free. Well, the problem is, is that when I'm not giving my time for free, I'm not really sparking conversations within the group. So the group just kind of sits there and it's just kind of dead. And, and, you know, it was just posting content all the time and so forth in a group that, you know, really um, the discussion wasn't thriving in there because most people were just in there to listen and, and not to discuss, which is fine. You know, I get that, but um, it's really not a good uh, usage of my time. And I had some other groups that I was running, you know, I had some author groups I was running and so forth. I've shut those down too. So I'm going to focus more on posting content in my app, in the MA Busy U app, which you can get on the iTunes store and the Android store, and uh, also in the Martial Arts Business Daily uh, Personal Coaching Group, which is the group where I'm actually in there coaching on a daily basis. And those people pay me a few hundred dollars a month to be in that group, and they can ask me questions directly and so forth and have direct access to me. So that's what I'm going to focus on, okay? Now, from there, I'd like to introduce the main topic, and our main topic for the day is how I went from loving to hating teaching martial arts to children. And I know just saying that <laughs> that line is uh, going to make this a controversial topic, but I think it's a topic that needs to be addressed because one of the things I realized when I was, uh, you know, doing my kind of personal inventory and, and personal assessment uh, of, you know, where I'm at over the last few weeks is what has changed in how much I enjoy teaching martial arts. And I still enjoy teaching martial arts. I would love to return to it at some time if my health allows for it. I don't think my health is stable enough right now to do it. Um, you know, and I, I would hate to, you know, start a class and start teaching all my students again. And then, you know, I have to take a couple of weeks off because I have some sort of health crisis or something. And the thing is, those health crises really aren't unexpected at this point. They're more expected. It's just something that I'm going to have to deal with for the next couple of years until my health stabilizes. But um, one of the things I also realized is that I just don't enjoy teaching children anymore. And I've known this for a couple of years, but really coming to grips with it, really coming to grips with the fact that, you know, if I were to open up a commercial martial arts studio again, I would not want to teach children's classes. I have no interest in teaching children anymore, which is a huge shift from where I started 30 years ago when I started my professional teaching um, career. And so that would make it much more difficult for me from a financial perspective, um, from a cash flow perspective, to run a full time martial arts studio. So that's something that, you know, I had to come to grips with. And that makes it, uh, you know, kind of the truth of the matter, you know, the facts of the matter that that now is not a good time for me to running full, be running full-time martial arts studios, not from a health perspective, a personal perspective, or from a personal goals, goals perspective and what I enjoy doing anymore. It's just not a good time for me to be doing that. And that brought that um, very much into stark perspective as I was, um, you know, evaluating how I feel about, you know, teaching these days. So, Here's the deal. I'm doing this particular topic. I'm, I'm talking about this particular topic in this podcast. And I think later I'm going to turn this podcast episode into kind of an open letter for parents, because I think parents really need to understand that um, 
that the way children are being raised today is much different from the way they were being raised a couple of decades ago. And I'm going to talk about that in a few, in a few minutes, but I think parents, I think most parents really, they're kind of tangentially aware of the impact that societal changes, um, changes in technology and our technology usage and so forth are having on children. But I don't think parents really know how deep the problem is. And I really blame that societal shift and those changes, those changes in uh, parenting and in children's behavior and so forth on my change in uh, how much I enjoy, you know, uh, teaching children. And uh, when I explain this to you, you're going to get what I'm talking about right now. Some of you are probably confused. You're probably like, but Mike, you wrote the book on, you know, teaching martial arts to kids. You know, you wrote that, you know, martial arts, uh, you know, character education lesson book for children, you know, for teaching, you know, martial arts character education lessons to children in martial arts schools. And, you know, you've got thousands of martial arts instructors around the world who are, you know, following that curriculum in their studio. And you've always encouraged martial artists to teach children. So why are you saying this now? Well, the thing is, I'm not telling you not to teach children. I also want to, I don't want anybody to misconstrue this into thinking that Mike is saying that uh, you shouldn't teach kids because teaching kids sucks. Okay. All I'm saying is, is that I don't enjoy it anymore. And I'm going to explain why. And I'm going to talk about what I think that we as instructors can do about it and uh, what we need to do as a society about it. Okay. And I want to say also, this isn't an attack on parents. I am one, but you know, this is a commentary on societal shifts that are negatively affecting children. And I think there's quite a bit of research behind it. So for you martial artists out there, martial artists and martial arts school owners who are listening to this podcast, I will have suggestions for you that are um, kind of, they're going to be sprinkled throughout the podcast. And a lot of the suggestions that I'm about to make can be communicated to parents and some can even be applied to your classroom as well. So pay attention. And, and I'm going to talk about it more. Actually, I'm going to cover specific suggestions in the tip of the week at the end of this podcast episode. So stay tuned for that. Okay. So let's talk about reason number one that caused me to not enjoy teaching children anymore. And it's really boils down to um, changing behaviors in children and parenting by iPad. Those behaviors caused by uh, parents who, who are parenting by screen time. Okay. Now we know that children today um, engage in excessive screen time. You know, I, I can tell you that my own child, you know, uh, when he got an iPad, we allowed him to get an iPad. He still doesn't have a smartphone yet, even though he's, he's, uh, almost in high school. Um, he got an iPad. He just wanted to spend all his time on the thing, you know, and it got to the point where he was sitting there staring at that screen for, you know, like eight hours a day. And I sat down with my wife. I'm like, look, you know, you are, I spend probably more, you know, interface with them more during the day than I do. And, uh, you know, cause a lot of times I'm working, you know, at odd hours and stuff because I, you know, working from home, running three businesses, you know, I would work you know, odd hours. So I spend time with Caleb during the day and then at night, you know, Deanna would take over and that's just the way it kind of was. And I told her, I said, you know, you need to really watch how much time you're spending at night on that thing. And I think we need to start limiting it. And so we did start limiting his screen time. And one thing we noticed is, is when we started limiting his screen time, that his interactions with us improved. And, uh, I think his, his attitudes improved as well. Um, but also, you know, I think he's happier not spending as much time on, you know, on the screen. And, you know, excessive screen time has been shown to have a very negative, a very deleterious effect on children. And, you know, I think a lot of children today, what I've observed is that they just lack basic interpersonal skills. They lack the ability to make eye contact and small talk and the ability to interact with people face to face, or they kind of, you know, they don't have those soft skills that people need to be able to excel in, uh, in society and in a uh, business environment, you know, in the working environment. And I think we're doing children a disservice by sending them out in the world without those skills. Now, a good place to start for looking at research on this, and I'm going to talk about some of this research, is Dr. Jean Twenge, which um, she is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University. And she's written several books. She wrote a book called iGen. I think her more recent book is, um, oh gosh, uh, you know what? I don't think I can remember the name of it right now, but I'll look it up later. I'll make sure I put it in the podcast notes. But uh, she's written a more recent book that's on Gen Z and how social media and um, internet usage and uh, digital media and smartphones have just destroyed, absolutely destroyed um, Gen Z. 
And it's just terrible, you know, the stuff she talks about. But I'm going to go over a little bit with you, okay? For, for one thing, and this is all from um, from Gene Twenge's uh, an interview and also um, from the Child Mind Institute where I pulled some of her research, okay? So first, um, clinical level of depression doubled between 2011 and 2019 in the U.S. among 12 to 17-year-olds. Now, if you're not seeing the correlation there, and I know correlation does not equal causation, but... The correlation there is that that is during the time when cell phone use, when mobile phone use, actually smartphone use, um, just in, in, in skyrocketed throughout the U.S. Where when cell phones became and mobile phones, smartphones, I should say, uh, became ubiquitous. You know, everybody had them and everybody's using them, and, and practically, you know, lots of kids have them now too. Social media use, she also links that to an increase in mental health problems among children and teens, including anxiety, depression, and suicidality. Uh, nearly 90% of 16 to 24 year olds use the internet for social networking and, and uh, Dr. Twinge has seen a correlation between those behaviors, especially excessive usage and um, increased depression, increased rates of depression, increased r rates of uh, reported anxiety, personal anxiety and social anxiety issues, and also um, suicidal thoughts, suicidal behaviors um, in children. She also says social media affects the reward centers that are active in teen brains, and an imaging study was done that has shown that these regions are activated when participants, meaning children, viewed images with a lot of likes. The response is strongest when the likes on the images are posted by the participant, and when viewing photographs of risky behaviors ostensibly taken and posted by their peers... Activation in the cognitive control network decreased. And what that indicates is that means that when kids are looking at content that they think that their peers approve of, that their ability to apply logic and reason and discernment to um, whether or not that content is objectively good or bad decreases substantially. Okay. So that's pretty interesting. What it means is when your kids get online and their friends are liking stuff that isn't good for them that they're less likely to discern that that behavior is positive or negative behavior. Um, if it is a negative behavior, then they are, if they're seeing that, um, that behavior or that, you know, something similar in real life. Okay. Cause it's just not as shocking. Now, eighth graders who spend 10 or more hours a week on social media are 50%, 56% more likely to report being unhappy than those who spend less time on social media. And uh, I don't think this is, you know, uh, I don't think it's any surprise to parents who are, you know, seeing kids and, and how they're, uh, how they're dealing with depression and anxiety today. Also, heavy users of social media increase their risk of depression by 27%. That's very interesting. And interestingly enough, teens report that Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram increase their feelings of anxiety, which is crazy to me. You know, that kids are on these um, social media apps and they're increasing their levels of anxiety, but yet they're still on them and many of them are addicted to them. And the reason for the addiction, as we know, if you've looked at any of this research, and there's a very, very good um, kind of uh, dramatic documentary on, uh, on uh, let's see, I think it's on Netflix, on uh, social media use and how it programs our brain and, and so forth. And I mean, it's crazy when you see this documentary. I'll also put a link to that in the show notes. But um, basically, programmers at these large social media companies like Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, etc., they have written their programs specifically to trigger the dopamine, uh, dopamine dumps in the, in the brain, you know? So when you're triggering dopamine dumps, you know, these little small dopamine, dopamine dumps, every time your, your body dumps dopamine into your system, it hits these dopamine receptors in the brain. You get this kind of, you know, momentary kind of, uh, you know, small high, if you will. And, uh, you know, you get this kind of sort of positive feedback loop that tells you the more you do that behavior, the better you're going to feel. And it really screws up uh, people's attention spans and so forth. And it screws up um, their ability to focus and concentrate and people, it's how people get addicted to um, social media and digital media. So now another interesting fact is that girls are disproportionately affected by the negative aspects of social media. I think some researchers like Dr. Twenge have, um, you know, speculated that this is due to the fact that a lot of social media content that young women look at 
is very, very focused on um, physical beauty and physical appearance, and that the pressures for young girls to look perfect, you know, online and to present this perfect appearance are just so, so drastically, um, you know, intense. And I, I don't think that children, you know, growing up in my generation, you know, I'm a Gen Xer, you know, we didn't have that pressure, you know, it just, it just really wasn't there. We didn't have that pressure to look good online 24, seven, 365, because we didn't have the internet and we didn't have that pressure to look good to our friends either. You know, if you were talking to your friends on the phone, well, nobody could see you, you know, now everybody's face, you know, uh, FaceTiming and so forth. And, you know, uh, people are posting stuff, uh, content online 24 seven, you know, friends are taking selfies and they want you to be involved. I think kids have a tremendous amount of behavior, especially young women or tremendous amount of pressure, especially young, young girls, young women, um, to just present this perfect, uh, physical appearance all the time and to put on a good face for social media as well. So more than twice as many girls as boys said that they'd been cyberbullied in the last year, 22% versus 10%. More than twice as many girls as boys rep report being cyberbullied. And boys' depression increased by 21% between 2012 and 2015, while girls increased by 50%. So obviously, young girls are affected a lot more by social media than boys are. So it's pretty disturbing. And the increase in overall um, rates of depression and, and uh, you know, suicidal ideation is really what is very concerning. And I suggest that you read Dr. Twenge's articles and books and, and so forth. I'll link a couple of them in the show notes because, you know, it's something you should be educated on as a martial arts instructor or a parent. So um, how, what do we do about this? Well, number one, and this is what we did with our children. Okay. So these are my suggestions or this with my child, I should say. Um, first, you need to limit screen time and access to social media. My kid does not have any social media accounts. He doesn't have access to social media. We don't let him access it. And we also limited his screen time as well. Um, he has limited screen time during the week and then a little bit more on the weekends, about double what he gets during the week. And he's fine with that. At first, I think it was difficult for him because he interacts with his friends a lot outside of school um, through digital devices. But now, you know, he's, he's kind of gotten used to it and he's learned how to balance and, and uh, you know, um, basically you know, to budget his screen time, if you will. Also, I, I don't believe in giving young kids smartphones. I think that there are dangers there that are not just the dangers of the negative influence of social media, but also the fact that, um, you know, pedophiles that, uh, you know, criminals that prey on children, sexual offenders that prey on children, um, that they hang out in areas, you know, in places where, you know, where kids are online. And I think if you give your kids smartphones, um, you're leaving them vulnerable. It's just another way for uh, for predators to get access to your children. So, um, you know, besides the fact that, you know, it, it leaves them, it also allows kids to have kind of an unmitigated access to um, content that they shouldn't be looking at, like pornography and so forth. And, and uh, when you look at some of the interesting research and reports that are being done on younger boys, especially who are being exposed to pornography at a very early age and how that is negatively impacting their view of what are and aren't healthy sexual relations between a man and a woman. Um, and uh, the problems that that's causing for for young men later in life, um, it's pretty telling, and it's it's more than I can get into, and it's not necessarily a, you know the. I don't know. It's kind of a blue topic. So I don't want to talk about that too much in this podcast episode, but it's something that you need to be aware of, especially if you have young men. So don't give young kids smartphones and make sure that you're, you know, some parents, you know, I think that they give their kids unmitigated use of smartphones and, you know, I should say unsupervised use. Um, and they're not monitoring what their kids are doing on those devices. And I think that's wrong. I think before you give your kid a device, I think you need to install, you know, an app that allows you to monitor their usage and limit their usage. Um, we use Custodio. There are other apps that you can use. There are plenty of resources out there for parents to use to be able to limit their, their children's time and monitor their time on social media and online and on their digital devices. I think you need to install those. You need to have those in place before you give your kids any digital device. Okay. So that's the first reason why I went or how I went from loving teaching children to hating teaching children, um, you know, martial arts, because I used to love it. And uh, I, I live for teaching children's classes. I just love teaching children. I loved impacting children's lives through um, teaching them character values um, through my martial arts classes. And then it just became a drag. Now, when did it become a drag? Well, it became a drag about the time that children started being exposed to uh, social media and digital devices. 
And so here's what happened. I taught martial arts for about 10 years straight in my first studio, my first successful studio. I sold that studio, took a couple of years off, started another studio a couple of years later. And I ran that studio from about the mid to the um, very late aughts. Okay. And uh, so I ran that studio for about five or six years. Then I sold that studio um, shortly after we had our first child or before we were actually, it was when we were planning to have um, Caleb. And so I had started another studio about the time that my wife got pregnant. And I think I started that studio because I knew I would need some extra income because I was about to become a father. And that studio that I ran was a, an all adult studio. I decided that I didn't want to teach kids while I was raising a young child because I wanted to be able to focus all my time and attention on my own child and not other people's children. And I think that was a pretty wise decision. So what happened is um, when my kid became old enough to take martial arts classes, I enrolled him in a friend's martial arts school first. So um, he took Kung Fu classes at a friend's martial arts school here in Austin. And then he got a little older and we enrolled him in jujitsu classes and he did jujitsu classes for a couple of years. Then I hired a private jujitsu instructor to train myself and uh, my son at home. And we did that for a couple of years. And then when I started teaching Krav Maga again, um, or I started teaching Krav Maga, you know, really semi full time, I guess. Um, and when my, I thought my child was old enough to do Krav Maga classes and I opened up a studio in 2019, I started teaching children's Krav Maga classes in order to give my son a place where he could train Krav Maga with other children. Cause it was very difficult for me to teach him Krav Maga because I'm so much bigger than him. Right. So in 2019, for the whole year of 2019, I taught children's martial arts classes. Consider that I hadn't taught kids for about a decade. I'd stopped teaching children sometime around 2009 and didn't start again until 2019. And uh, obviously right before the pandemic and the difference that I noticed in children's behaviors and their ability to focus and their social interaction skills between 2009, the end of the late aughts and 2019, the end of the teens is a marked difference, insane difference, just unbelievable. Prior to um, the advent of smartphones, digital media, social media, et cetera, children having access to all those technologies, you know, um, you know, on a regular basis, I would work with children. And uh, for the most part, I would have maybe like one to 2% of the children I worked with who had behavioral issues, um, who couldn't focus, who couldn't concentrate, who would have, you know, sudden outburst in the middle of, you know, teaching or classroom, you know, like inappropriate outburst and so forth. And I would say that in that time, it, the numbers didn't necessarily flip flop. It didn't go from being like 2% of my class that was, you know, classroom, uh, children in my classroom that were problem children um, to being like 98% that were, but it was a good portion. I'd say at least 50% of the children in the classroom uh, in, you know, when I started teaching again in 2019, had some type of behavioral issues to where they would, you know, they would make an appropriate outburst in class, you know, like not raising their hand or something or just, you know, having poor impulse control was, was really what it amounted to. Um, also, kids just couldn't make eye contact anymore. Um, they lacked respect when I would ask kids to call me Mr. Massey or sir, you know, they would look at me like I was nuts, you know, because um, I think a lot of parents and teachers just weren't making children respect them anymore. Also, I noticed that a lot of the kids in my classes, and this is something that really bothered me. So a lot of children in my classes in, uh, in that 2019 classroom, as compared to the classroom I had from, you know, the kids I had in my classroom from, say, you know, when I started teaching back in, gosh, man, I guess it was the early 90s. Yeah, it was really the early 90s when I started teaching professionally, you know, for the, the that decade, you know, from, say, uh, 1990 to the year 2000 or so, or, you know, 2003 or whatever. Well, actually through, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I'm getting my years confused. But when I first started teaching and then decades later, I noticed that children really had problems with self-esteem. The children coming in my classroom, the majority of them had problems with self-esteem. Um, these children did not take um, even, you know, very positively couched constructive criticism well. I noticed it was very, very easy to um, injure a student's self-confidence and that children were much more 
Oh gosh, they just weren't as tough. They was just kids weren't as mentally, emotionally as tough as they used to be, and that really surprised me. That really shocked me. That was one of the things that I that I noticed almost immediately that really threw me for a loop, because kids just are not as mentally and emotionally resilient as they used to be, and I think, and this is just my own personal theory, but I think it's because children are um, either. I guess either they have a perception of being under attack all the time, or they really are under attack all the time as far as um, personal attacks and, and uh, bullying and so forth, you know, at school, they never get away from it. In other words, you know, if they're getting bullied at school or if a child is having self-esteem issues at school or they're having, you know, um, social interaction issues at school and they're not able to interact with their children, it used to be in my generation that we could get away from it when we got away from school, we'd go home and you would have some respite from that. And home would be, you know, kind of like your, uh, you know, sanctuary, if you will, from all that bullying and the negative behavior and so forth that you got from other children. Now kids can't get away from it because they're exposed to it all the time. Kids are bullying them on social media. They're getting on social media and posting, you know, negative comments and tagging them in those comments and making fun of them and, you know, just doing all sorts of horrible stuff online. So I think that that has really impacted um, kids' ability to um, to function without feeling um, without experiencing negative repercussions on their self esteem. You know, they I, I just don't think kids can function as well as they used to in that regard. And so this is all very concerning, and it's also also very telling because it was just a decade. And during that decade, again, this is the decade that Dr. Twin Twenge, um cites in her research as the decade when um, digital device use, smartphone use, uh, social media use became widespread and children were exposed to it more and more. So what a difference 10 years makes. And that's the reason why I think the kids lack the ability to focus now too. And, and this is something I noticed in my own child because during that time before we started limiting his social media, uh, well, not social media, but his digital media exposure and his, uh, his ability to access digital devices. Um, I noticed a change in his focus and his reading attention because we'd got him reading a few years prior and he started to really love reading and, and, you know, was really kind of enamored of certain books and so forth. There were certain, uh, you know, uh, book series that he really loved. And then he got to the certain age where he was spending more and more time on the iPad and we just couldn't get him to read and he showed no interest in it. Well, it became a problem when he had to start reading at school. And that problem was very, very marked, and it had a great impact on his ability to um, to perform in school in the classroom. So we had to do some things about it to help him learn how to refocus again. And the first thing we did was it was about the same time that we limited his screen time. And then I started working with him on uh, showing him how to break down how to read um, sections of text and actually focus on what he was reading and um, analyze it as he was reading and then go back and analyze it and look at it again and really break it down you know for the meaning and the concepts and so forth and themes within whatever he was reading and and it took some work on his part he really had to work really hard to get to the point to where he could do it another problem he was having in school was his ability to focus during lectures because as you get you know older you know he's in a private school and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's a school that you know where they focus on more of a classical education and so one of his, uh, his teachers this year, she kind of teaches her class. She lectures to them almost like a college professor because they're trying to prepare these kids for high school and college and beyond. And uh, he was having a very hard time in the classroom focusing on the professor and uh, on the teacher and, you know, what she was saying. And, you know, I had some discussions with her about it. And then we came back and, you know, we talked about it and, and had to develop strategies for him to be able to focus during the classroom. And, and the most recent report we've gotten from his teacher is that um, he's improved dramatically as far as his ability to focus and, and you know, his, his reading comprehension and so forth. But, you know, I think his issues in those in that area. I don't think he always had them. I think it went back to his excessive use of, uh, of looking at that digital device, you know, being on the iPad all day long, you know, I think that's what kind of ruined his behavior. So, you know, that's the second reason. That's why I think kids today are focused challenge. That's my second reason for, you know, not liking teaching kids anymore, teaching kids martial arts. And I think, again, it all goes back to digital devices. So reason number three, my third reason for 
um, how or why I moved from loving teaching children martial arts to hating teaching children martial arts is because of parents who shift the blame for their kids' behavior. And I know I said at the beginning of this podcast, this is not an attack on parents. Um, It's that whole not my kid thing. I get that completely, okay? I think every parent is in many ways um, has blinders on as far as their children's behaviors. You know, we are naturally inclined to think the best of our children and to see the best in our children and to not believe that our children are capable of poor behaviors. But on the other hand, after working with kids for 20 years, I can tell you every child, no matter how good, is capable of um, wrongdoing at some point, okay? Anybody is, really. And I think the societal shift toward this entitlement mentality versus a personal accountability mentality is what is at the core of it. Okay. And I think a lot of parents um, that come from that generation, those generations where generations that came after mine, where there, they were taught a lot of personal entitlement. You know, these are the generations of children that were brought up being told, you know, constantly that they were winners, you know, that, you know, the whole, everyone's a winner thing and being told that they were special and so forth. And I think because of the type of language that we use with children, raising those generations that came after mine, I think they grew up with a lot of entitlement and a lot of, uh, you know, unreasonable expectations of, um, you know, um, how they were going to be treated by society and their own personal fulfillment and so forth. And it's interesting because I talk with my wife about the people that um, come into her particular, um, you know, uh, area of work. She works in the legal field. She works for the federal government. You know, in the federal government, they don't pay as well as they do in the private sector, but the benefits are better, which makes it a place and also the jobs are much more stable. So it makes it a place where people who are looking for a long-term stable career are very likely to go. The problems that they're having where she works is that they can't get young people to stick around because the young people come in and what they find out is, is they're working with um, federal judges and they're working with um, very high performance attorneys and these high performance attorneys and federal judges and so forth. Um, they have high expectations for performance and federal judges are not known to be people who um, hold back when it comes to um, saying, what they mean and what they expect out of subordinates. And a lot of these young people, they just can't handle it. And they come into this job and they find out it's a lot of work and then it's very difficult to learn and pick up the skills and that there's a lot of pressure and stress and they just quit and they go and they work somewhere else. You know, they'll go and work for some tech company where, you know, they get, um, you know, catered meals every day and they bring in their laundry and their laundry's done for them while they're at work and they've got dog walkers there and all this crazy stuff that they get that are things that these tech companies are having to do to keep these young people employed. And so what you have is, is you have this movement toward, you know, nanny schools, nanny colleges and and nanny employers. And I think that um, that whole mentality of those adults, and those are the adults that are also having children now that are, you know, have kids that, uh, you know, are of age to take our classes and our martial arts schools and so forth. I think those parents have failed to set realistic expectations of personal responsibility on their children and failing to do that sets these unrealistic expectations of what's going to happen and what's expected of them performance-wise in the workplace. And I think that has a negative, major negative effect on children as they enter the workplace later on in life, as we saw with the, um, with the, the generations that are, you know, that came after mine. Now I'm not making, I I hope this doesn't come across as that I'm making blanket statements about um, the work ethic and so forth of millennials and uh, other generations that came after. Okay. I'm not doing that because, you know, all the millennials that I know, they're all adults. They're all, they all have careers. They all have children. They all have families now, you know? So, so I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that they, they lack a work ethic. I, I just think it was our fault that we brought those children up um, with unrealistic ex- expectations of what would be expected of them in the workplace, in society as adults. And I think it, it, it was hard on them. And I think it had a negative impact on them. And I think we're making the same mistakes with the next generations of children, but they're even worse because of the impact of social media, the use of digital devices and so forth. And, and, you know, the impacts those are having on, on children's brains and, and their development and their cognitive function. So what do we do about this? Well, that's the topic of this tip of the week. So um, let's talk about that The now. tip of the week. It's time for our featured martial arts business tip of the week. 
For more great tips, be sure to visit martialartsbusinessdaily.com to subscribe to our newsletter. And while you're there, click on the Business Resources tab for links to all Mike's martial arts business books and courses. Now, here's your martial arts business tip of the week. Okay, so I'm running long in this podcast because I've talked a lot about this topic because it's something that I'm kind of passionate about. And I also want to be thorough about the topic, but, you know, I can be more thorough in the show notes. So I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to try to wrap this up pretty quickly. What can we do about this as instructors? Well, it boils down to three things. We need to inform, educate, and encourage our clientele on these topics. So the first step is we want to inform parents about the dangers of excessive screen time and social media use among kids and teens, but we need to do it in a manner that's respectful. We need to do it respectfully. You can't just go to a parent and say, hey, you're parenting wrong, okay? Especially if, as I was early in my martial arts instruction uh, or career as a martial arts instructor and school owner, um, if you don't have kids, you know, if you're not raising kids yet and you try to tell parents how to parent, they're going to look at you like you're nuts. They're going to tell you, uh, the first thing they'll ask you is, do you have kids? No. Well, then you don't know what I'm going through. You know, that's what you hear. And it's funny because I always said I wasn't going to be one of those types of parents and now I am. So whatever, but um, you need to be respectful. Okay. So instead of preaching to parents, you should just share authoritative articles and information on social media and in your newsletter or, you know, however you communicate with your, uh, with your clientele. I think Jack, Dr. Uh, Gene Twenge's books are a good start. Again, if you go to the show notes for this episode, I'll list some links on the show notes. Um, but just share that information. Look up some some articles that she's written and so forth, and maybe some interviews or whatnot. You know, if you want to share um, video instead of you know uh, a bunch of you know, um, I don't know, uh, long articles people aren't necessarily going to read because maybe they lack um, the ability to focus and pay attention to. Okay. Second, you need to educate kids on what is and isn't a healthy use of digital media and digital devices, but you got to keep it simple with kids. You know, you can't, you know, you can't start spouting off statistics and so forth because that's just not going to reach kids. You need to tell kids stories. If you want kids to understand and to relate to what you're telling them, you need to relate it through stories. So I would say that you want to mention the topic in Matt Chats every so often and just share stories about children um, and how children spend who spend the most time on social media and digital devices tend to experience more sadness, more anxiety, and more isolation than kids who spend less time there. And if you've read any articles and so forth, you might use an example of a specific specific child within that was mentioned within an article, you know, and you can make up a name for them or something like that to personalize it more. But if you use specific examples and tell specific stories about specific people, kids are going to be more likely to relate to that. Also, you want to talk about cyber bullying. You need to talk about what it is, why kids should refrain from it, and also how to combat it. And that's a topic for another podcast. I don't have time to go into it, but there are numerous positive, excellent resources and books out there that you could read, that you could look up, that will help you develop a curriculum or at least a few lesson plans for that. Then you need to suggest alternatives to spending excessive time online. Ask your students, you know, what are some healthy alternatives to spending hours a day on screen time? And then let the kids answer. Allow them to answer. Listen to their answers. You know, no matter how goofy, you know, just just let them go. And then round out the list with suggestions such as reading a book, going for a walk, practicing martial arts, spending time with family and friends face to face. Face to face is so important. And doing a physical activity, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, we need to encourage these behaviors by sponsoring social media and digital device fast in our studios. Just challenge kids, even your adult students, to stay off social media and their digital devices one day a week. Just one day a week. Just challenge them to do that. And then when they come back, discuss, how did that feel? Say, how did that feel? You know, uh, you know, and then ask them what they did instead of spending all that time on social media. Also, be honest and transparent during the conversation because one thing kids hate is, and they can spot it immediately, is a fake. Just ask them, you know, say, hey, was it boring at first? Listen to their answers. And then say, what then? And then listen to their answers again. And then ask them, you know, or you could say, what happened after that as a way to get them to continue discussing it? And then ask them, what changed? Because the thing is, a kid's not going to stay bored for long. If they're um, honestly staying off their favorite device that keeps their brain occupied, you know, gives them that brain candy, if you will, that hit of dopamine, you know, every five to 15 seconds. And they have to stay off that device all of a sudden, whether it's a personal um, decision or not, a child is not going to stay unoccupied or um, not entertained for long. 
So you need to let the kids talk about things they did instead to keep themselves entertained and then ask them what changed, what changed in their behavior, what changed in the way that they were interacting with their environment, and what changed in how they felt. After you've introduced these concepts, pick a week to do a social media and digital device fast challenge. So pick a week to do a challenge where people stay off their social media device, social media accounts, stay off their digital devices and so forth. During the challenge, you want to tell your students, just ask them to resolve to only using social media and digital devices for school assignments and necessary communications with their family members. Then provide them again with alternatives to the time they normally spend online. Provide a suggested reading activity uh, reading an activity list by the day. For example, on day one, you could tell them, suggest that they read the first chapter in a good book. Day two, that they work on a puzzle or a board game, play a board game with family member or friends. Day three, that they do something outside with uh, family and friends, etc. Ask parents to vouch for their children's behavior and compliance and then reward kids who complete the challenge in some way, you know, come up with some sort of meaningful reward that kids really want. It doesn't have to be something super expensive. It could be just a certificate. You know, I personally in my studios, I always liked using a prize bucket too, which was just a bucket, you know, a, a big clear bucket that was full of prizes that we got from like the dollar store and, you know, from the front counter area at the toy store and so forth, you know, just stuff that's inexpensive that kids can just reach in there and grab one for a prize. Um, so that's what I suggest that you do in order to use your position as a martial arts instructor to help affect positive change in these areas for your clientele and for society. We're going to have to change as a society overall at some point because we can't go on the way we've been going on. It's obvious that the behaviors that we are allowing children to engage in and the way that they're interacting with digital media and social media is having a, an extreme negative effect on their mental health. We have to change that. And we as instructors, you can't strong arm your parents into doing this. You know, you can't tell your you know, parents, gosh, you know, your kid can't focus. So you need to keep them off social media and off, you know, off their digital devices. You know, that's not going to fly. We have to gradually inform people, educate them, and then encourage them to participate in those behaviors so they can have the opportunity to see the positive effect that it has on their families and on their children. And once we do that, hopefully, you know, you're going to have a school full of parents who maybe are a little bit more actively involved in, in raising their children. So that's my suggestion. Okay. So that's it for this episode of the MA Biz Podcast. I want to thank you for joining me and also encourage you to be sure to visit mabizu.com for information on the MA Biz U app and all my books, and courses. And I will see you in the next podcast episode. You've been listening to the Martial Arts Business Podcast with Mike Massey. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. And if you've enjoyed this show, leave us a positive review while you're there. Thanks for your support. And tune in again next time for more great martial arts business tips and advice from martialartsbusinessdaily.com.